I'm going to do a quick one here for Ben. Um, in the UK, Ben, there is a, a CVSA, it's CVSA UK in the UK that might have um, the ability to uh, address you to a specialist there. And I can work with the doctor in the UK. I don't have a UK medical license, but I've done several in London with some doctors in which I go over the DNA with the doctor and help the doctor to learn what to do. Consulting with them. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Bowles. Uh, looks like we had somebody that was asking with no income uh, and insurance, anything you can recommend, Dr. Uh, you know, the, um, the vast majority do get the the testing done under insurance. Um, usually there are the, the codes that can use for that. Not everyone can do that. And not everyone has insurance. And certainly out of the United States, that's problematic. Um, it's it's just that the testing all 3 billion nucleotides and interpreting it takes an extraordinary amount of time and effort and money and machinery and everything. And it, it is it is an expensive process. But the what most people pay um, to go through this process um, is less than what you'll pay for your copay if you get, you know, one hospitalization or less than two ER visits. So, but there, I'm not aware of any foundation that um, has money for this. So, right. A lot of information that comes out of there. Uh, people are asking if you treat uh, adults, Dr. Bowles. I know you have a limit on uh, the age group that you can see. Uh, do you um, want to kind of discuss that a little bit? Yeah, I generally see under 25 as the physician, and I'm very occasionally I have permission to go up to 30, but my ins insurance situation, because I'm a pediatrician, doesn't go above 30. But over 30, I can do a peer to peer where um, I work with your physician. If the patient is physically in the United States at the time, they can be in there and ask questions and be on the you know on the Zoom or the Teams call at the same time. Um, but they're physically outside of the U.S. at the time. The lawyers are saying, I can't do it. I can do it with the doctor, but not with the family present. Um, so over age 30, I mean, I've done 70 year olds before. I mean, it can be done. It's just that I'm not the doctor. I'm helping an adult doctor treat the patient. Consulting on it. Perfect. Thank you. Um, people are talking about the treatment guidelines, the pediatric ones that are being worked on right now. Um, and I think that depends on where they're at in their, <laughs> their cycle, whether or not that's going to be included, but they do try and keep as much information, uh, especially the current stuff, uh, inflicting into that um, process. Um, let's see. Can a significant neurological orthopedic injury, spinal injury, cause CVS? Um, I've never heard of it before. I, I A lot of things can happen and everyone is different, but I haven't heard of it. Okay. I imagine if you hit that one part of the brainstem that it, it damaged it, it could, but I haven't seen it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Somebody was asking about a dosage for, for of riboflavin for headaches, but that's not something that we can uh, discuss on call because that would be something you'd need to go over with your physician. Um, let's see. And then so somebody was asking about the process for coordinating. Would that be best for them to reach out to you, Dr. Bowles? Liz does that, but I can, I mean, I didn't put Liz's email on this, unfortunately. Um, I think you can get there by this link here. This, this link here, the neurogenic. Okay. Or you uh, can just email me and I'll just forward it to her. But Liz is the one that does the coordination. So if it's any question about medical care whatsoever that, you know, wanting to have DNA testing, wanting your doctor to do DNA testing, that would go to here neurogenomics. So this would be for the neuro needs. That's the products. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Somebody had a question about uh, their multiple admissions uh, over the years and some of the hospitals suggested testing for uh, peripheria. Have you seen any correlation? I know that's... Uh, you know, porphyria. Um, there have been patients that have had variants in the porphyria genes and they haven't been, they, I, they may be contributing factors. Certainly porphyria is an extremely rare cause of, vomit, of cyclic vomiting. Um, and I tested a whole lot of people for peripheria and never found one, <laughs> but it it might contribute to a small degree, but I have not seen it as a significant issue here. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, then there was somebody asking about who they should see to be diagnosed with CVS, a GI neurologist. And um, I think you'll probably answer this the same way I would. <laughs> but did you want to take it? Knows. Whoever knows. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, and sometimes yeah. not even that, right? I mean, a, yeah, a very that, helpful yeah, right. There's not, that, yeah, whoever knows. Yeah, it's somebody that hopefully is is familiar with it. But most people are going to see GI first, just to rule out any uh, other kind of uh, conditions or disorders. Um, let's see. Oh, there was somebody that was asking if you do the peer-to-peer uh, -peer consultations uh, with PCPs, or if there's a specific type of doctor that you need to work with. Uh, whoever is legal to practice medicine in that jurisdiction. It works. I mean, whoever's going to take care of your child is the one I should talk to. I mean, real, right, because they're the one that needs to know. Um, so that could be a functional medicine doctor, um, which is a really good idea to get if you haven't gotten one. Or it could be a GI or a neurologist or a PCP. It could be a nurse practitioner. It can be a natural path. It's whoever it is that's taking care of your child that legally can practice medicine in the jurisdiction you're pa that patient is currently in or in at the time or I know I always tell people if your doll if your doctor is willing to learn or oh. <laughs> willing to help you out, that's really kind of more of where it, it needs to be. So I don't write the laws, I just stay out of jail. <laughs> right. I mean, so I, <laughs> There's you know, limitations, it, unfortunately, right? With everyone. Yeah, I mean telemedicine <laughs> is practicing medicine at the location in which the patient is at. If it's your child, you and I can be in the Bahamas. Doesn't matter. It's where your it's where your child is. That's where it's telemedicine is being done. Yeah. And that's opened up quite a bit. So hopefully um, it, it keeps going. Until the, I mean, the Biden administration said that the COVID things on telemedicine go away at the end of 2024. So until the end of 2024, I can practice in all 50 states. Um, after that, um, you'll have to be in one of the five states I'm licensed in. We're thinking of adding a couple. Right now, it's California, Arizona, um, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Florida. So a lot of families will say, oh, we'll just go to Florida. We'll have a vacation there and we'll get on telemedicine there. So that will, you know, that will work. And I, I, I might add a couple in the middle of the country. I'm hoping to, to get the um, economic people at the, at the practice to realize that it's an advantage to do that. But getting people to spend money is not always easy. No, not at all. Uh, we did have somebody that asked about uh, getting insurance to agree to running sequencing. Um, do you have any, because I know that's, I mean, that's one we come across well, a lot. Well, using and... the right codes. I mean, using codes that are legal, but the codes that are more likely to, to be useful. Um, in, there's an encephalopathy code that you're that often will work. Um, if there's any, any hard neurological problems are certainly things you want to put at the top of the list. Those are called the G codes, G for golf. Um the codes you don't want to use are the F codes, F for Foxtrot. I mean, that's like autism code or ADHD or anxiety or, you know, any things like that are typically thought of as mental illness because there is a prejudice against it. And the insurance companies are unlikely to do genetic testing for an F code. So you want the G codes to be at the top, of course, if it's legal and uh, proper. But um, and then just getting the letters. I mean, we have Letters that start reasonably nice and work out to be downright nasty to the insurance companies. <laughs> if, they, if they keep saying no, you know, depending on why they say no, and we can, you know, hit them on different things. So we have all these letters. So we have a lot of experience in getting genetic testing um, approved. Not everyone has insurance that will pay for genetic testing. You get what you pay for. There are labs that are almost free for genetic testing, but the results are not useful. And do you feel there's a difference with people being um, related with the familial link, uh, if that matters for getting the sequencing approved? Um, you mean if there's more than one person in the family that's affected? Uh, the example that was given was there was uh, adoption. The Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, it is harder if you have neurodevelopmental problems in an adoption, because most of the mutations are de novo that are not in the parents and they're very hard to find if you don't have the parents. Um, for cyclic vomiting without a, um, if there are no syndromic, 
They're not really small. They don't have developmental problems or autism, no birth defects or abnormal features. You can just do the child and that's fine, adopted or otherwise. Thank you. And then somebody was talking about some of the off labels. All medications used for CVS are considered off label. <laughs> and almost everything in pediatrics is off label anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, Robin... everything that I have in there is off label. Everything I discuss is off label. It's is there, you know, when you're doing personalized medicine, you can't label it. It's it's for an N of one. It's for that patient's finding. Okay, uh, Robin, we can't we can't really talk to which um, companies would cover the genetic testing. That's uh, something you'd have to talk to your insurance about. Um, and if you're like me, I just tend to argue with my insurance company a lot <laughs> and keep appealing because that's really uh, what it is and, and proving that uh, it saves them money. What it comes down to is if it saves the insurance company money, um, they're more likely to uh, work with you on it. And grief. Yes. If you're the type that is going to make their life a living hell, if they're, <laughs> they're likely to. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I, there's some that I've argued for over two years and eventually, yes, they just go, all right, just give in. <laughs> I'll keep arguing. Uh, let's see. The high potassium diet mostly during episodes or between episodes as well? Um, you know, when you have an episode, you don't want to stop the stuff because then the episode, but you do your best during episodes. We're talking about all the time. Most of the, everything I spoke about in this particular lecture is to try to avoid episodes so they never happen. But potassium can also be useful during episodes as well. Okay. And somebody asked if there's anything less than 2000 for gene testing, uh, which gene tests might be covered by Medicaid. Again, that's something we can't really Medicaid answer. usually does in most states. It's, it's, it's 50 different Medicaids plus DC. Medicaid usually does pay these days. It wasn't that way two years ago um, at all. Um, so it it's it, very antics is where I do it most of the time. I think it's about it's come down a lot. I'm trying to remember what the price, like 1800 or something like that. I'm, I'm, I may be misquoting for it for, to do whole genome sequencing. So it's really it for the cash price. It's really come down a lot. Yeah, over the last few years. Remember when I first started looking, it was, you, you were talking, you know, five to 10. <laughs> oh, you didn't get in at so. the beginning, believe me. <laughs> when when I was starting to work. <laughs> yeah, no, we were. Was... <laughs> uh, somebody asked about uh, CPT codes or a medical coder trying to help out their doctor, would that be something you'd want to direct to Liz? I mentioned the G codes are sometimes better. Okay. Uh, does the diet need monitoring? Monitoring Was that the... It's you know, there are enough. occasional patients in which the diet sets off an episode, particularly the ones with MCAS or the mast cell activation disorder. Uh, but for the most part, I think a lot of the dietary stuff was potassium related. More potassium, better. Less potassium, worse. Um, and if you think about the typical kid diet that's all white food, there's not much potassium in there. Okay. Uh, and that looks like there was one last question uh, with a correlation between uh, CVS and cannabis. Uh, you know, it's um, it's very complex because... If you give any drug, and I mean Motrin, you, any drug at all, ibuprofen, it causes changes in the body that make it more likely the symptoms. So it's not uncommon to get rebound headaches. And people that take ibuprofen every day, they get headaches. And they will only go away once you stop it. Any drug is likely to cause the problem that you're trying to avoid. So cannabis is just like any other drug. You, get, you take cannabis all the time. You're likely to cause a situation in which nausea and vomiting are there that weren't there before or that CVS will get worse. It's like if you take Motrin occasionally for a migraine, it can be helpful or cannabis occasionally. I'm in California where it's completely legal and no one cares, you know, so and in other states, they may say no to this. But a lot of my patients will take, you know, a legal cannabis product, a legal safe cannabis product at a safe dose, not very often. And it helps. But it, it, drug abuse with any drug, you know, one drink of alcohol does not make an alcoholic. 
you know, the same thing with cannabis or something, but overuse can cause trouble. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then people had, uh, where can we find uh, high potassium diet suggestions or if there's a particular uh, potassium diet? Yeah. <laughs> diet Google high recommend. potassium diet and then look at, I do this all the time with my patients and then go on images. And you'll see all of these platters of high potassium, one of which I copied without permission. I showed a slide. <laughs> Don't tell us that. <laughs> <laughs> We're putting it on YouTube. That could be bad. <laughs> there you go. Uh, okay, somebody asked about MSG uh, causes uh, episodes in their uh, patient. Should they avoid other food additives if that's one well, they noted? MSG, the G is glutamine, and glutamine is the major thing that happens in nerves or any other cell that become hyperactive. So a lot of treatments are anti-glutamine treatments, anti-glutamate treatments, actually, glutamate, sorry, that's the G. Um, so MSG makes sense that it could cause a hyperactivity, especially in the gut, which it goes to. But um, there's a lot of hype in MSG, too. In general, if you're eating a lot of um, processed foods, it's probably not good for you. <laughs> that food should look like the original organism to the most part. I know that she doesn't look like a cow, but, you know, at least something that your great grandmother would recognize as food. <laughs> When I was in medical training, they said, if your grandmother recognized it as food, it's probably okay. Now we have to say great grandmother. <laughs> that makes makes a lot of sense, I guess. <laughs> okay, let's see. So we did have questions. People were asking when the recording is going to be uh, available. It will be announced that it's been put up on the CVSA um, YouTube channel. If you guys uh, follow us on YouTube or on any social uh, networks. When it goes up, that'll be announced. It'll also be in the e-newsletter if you get that from CVSA. Um, so, you know, just follow us there or, you know, check back for that because it will be up there uh, in a couple days. Um, and somebody had a question about the sound sensitivity being related. And I think that's the, the last one we'll take before we. Um, um, yeah, sensitivity to all stimuli. It's often sound or light, but it can be touch or anywhere else, taste, smell. Um, hypersensitivity is a migraine like thing. And I mean, CVS is, we didn't talk about this, but I mean, it, it it's one of the migraine related conditions. So, but migraines are, are mitochondrial and migraines are channelopathy in general. So. so it all fits in there. Do you think yeah. the dizziness has to do with that? So, or do I'm you sorry, think what? that's different? Do you think the dizziness ties into that with the migraines? Or do you um, think that's it's probably it's related as well. Oh. And like I say, I have a lot of patients in which dizziness is a significant part of their episodes and in a few that is the major episode. Mm hmm Okay. Well, thank you for that, Dr. Bowles. Uh, I think we'll call it uh, call it at that. I really appreciate you taking the time today um, to present us with all this information. And glad to hear you know you got some the the new publications coming out there. It's very exciting to to kind of follow along and and see this. So I appreciate you taking the time today. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank you.